everybody. I'd like to introduce uh, Jan Sirnov to you, and he is going to explain to us how he ported NetBSD to the Lattice Micro 32 soft CPU, and how he had to modify the CPU before being able to run NetBSD. Test, okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, so, as Martin said, uh, going to uh, talk about um, what I did as a hobby project uh, recently, and it involved uh, porting uh, NetBSD and HBSD, which has been presented uh, yesterday, um, on an open source CPU called uh, Lattice Micro 32. So, okay, I've already been presented, so I'm, um, I will be joining uh, M Labs um, in a few days, uh, which is, was formerly known as Milky Mist Community, and which has been uh, incorporated recently by its founder. Um, so, that's a cool company doing uh, interesting open source uh, hardware and software stuff like the Milky Mist board, if you out of it, all the Milky Mist system and chip. I will talk about it a bit later. So, okay, let's talk about this port and more specifically, uh, port it on the Milky Mist 1 board. Um, first part, I will talk a bit about the hardware, so talk about the MMU and then a bit about software. But first, what's the Milky Mist 1? It's this. Um, it's an electronic device uh, aimed at generating um, video effects uh, in which are in real time synchronized to a lot of sources like for instance uh, audio input or uh, MIDI or DMX, events, etc. So it's a kind of a, uh, an artistic device um, that can be used a bit like this so you can um, film someone, a performer, and then you project against the wall at, at a party or at a concert and you apply nice real-time video effects like rotation, zoom in, zoom out, or blurring, etc. And you can interact with all kind of um, party-like devices like MIDI, keyboard, etc. So that's the device and it produces nice effects like these ones, those are screenshots of the device output. And the cool thing about this device, it's not just any closed source commercial device, because it, it uses um, an FPGA as its main component, and most of the interesting parts of the device functions are implemented inside this FPGA. So it's not uh, fixed in time, you can play with it, you can modify, you can uh, do your hack stuff on it, and it's pretty cool. So uh, what's an FPGA? So it's a chip, basically, like any other, but you can um, configure it to behave a bit the way you want. So it, you've got logic blocks um, located as an array, and IO block, and you can configure each logic block to do something like logi logic operation, like add or uh, XOR or stuff like that. And then you have a switching matrix that allow you, allows you to interconnect those uh, logic blocks and you decide which block you connect to which other. And then you can create uh, basically a logic circuit and you can do this a, a lot of times and you can basically implement almost for free an ASIC chip. But ASIC chips could cost usually thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, this, um, the PCB, this uh, electronic circuit, which is also open source, so it contains this FPGA, and on the FPGA, it runs the Milky Mist system on chip, which is also open source. So it's a whole bunch of um, um, function blocks, which are controlling, I don't know, for instance, the USB or the, the sound or uh, MIDI, DMX, the UART, etc., the DRAM or the frame buffer. So all, all those controllers are making the device uh, work. And then on the bottom left, you've got the Micro32 CPU. That's the, 
the main component I will be talking about is the, the soft core CPU uh, which is running on this FPGA <coughs> and which will be running NetBSD. So, okay, Miko32. So, 32 bits have an architecture, it's a risk. Uh, big Indian, that's six stages. Uh, it's just fully bypassed, so it's um, pretty okay in terms of performance. And you can put caches or not, you can disable them, and they are uh, up to two way set associative. And it's using the Wishbone on chip bus, which is um, an open source um, specification uh, bus which is used by all the open cores uh, community of open source hardware cores uh, devices. So you can easily find a lot of open source cores which are uh, um, talking this protocol, this on-chip bus protocol. We've got tons of, of them. So okay, and this CPU actually works on pretty much every FPGA because it's, it's device agnostic. It doesn't use uh, specific blocks from sp uh, one specific FPGA vendor, for instance. So you can, for instance, run this CPU on the DE0 Nano, which is running an Altera chip, uh, or on the uh, Milchemist one, uh, running, uh, featuring an s 6 FPGA from Xilinx, Papilio Pro, uh, or the Mixio, which is a new uh, project from MLabs, a video mixer, also open source. And or even uh, the new Kintec 7 series from Xilinx. So uh, all of these could run and, ca and run actually run uh, those days uh, Micro 32. So why is it interesting? It's small. It really, really doesn't take a lot of resources inside the FPGA. Um, it's, well, as I said, it's portable and it's pretty fast. Uh, a lot of CPU open source also that you can find on the internet, usually they run at uh, 20, 25 megahertz and this one can run up to 200 megahertz on recent chips. It actually works. And there are a lot of CPUs that are a hobby project that you can find on the web, but most of them are a lot buggy if they actually do work in the end. So it's one of the few that works. And it has an OK uh, software support. We've got the GCC, BNUT, GDB, even QMU, which is really handy. Um, and it's open source. No, to the bad points. Uh, it had no memory management unit, so I couldn't port NetBSD. But that's one of the few, uh, that one of the first thing I, I fixed. Uh, I worked on this with uh, Michael Valo. It's a two-man job. <laughs> and the CPU is used in some closed-source commercial ASICs, so it's pretty solid. It's been implemented in real, uh, real chips. And it can achieve a pretty decent frequency in quite all uh, cell process. So um, it's a standard um, uh, risk pipeline. So just get the address computations, then you've got the instruction fetch, then decode, execute, load, store, and write back. So I think all of you already understand all of this. So OK. Um, this is a simplification uh, a drawing of um, the CPU, uh, the original CPU, how it was working. So we've got the pipeline on the left, then you've got the two instruction and data caches on the right, and then main memory is off chip. And originally there was no MMU and no notion of virtual addressing. So physical address was used everywhere. So you were directly uh, talking almost to the RAM chip, and there were no translations, so it was okay to run UC Linux, for instance, which does run to some extent, but as I understood it, NetBSD couldn't work on such a system. So um, we modified it, so we added this memory management unit, so that on the left, the pipeline only uh, manages virtual addresses, and then it gets translated and goes through to uh, main memory as physical addresses. So th in this way, we were able to, to have a, a something to, to run at BSD. So OK, well, but a bit about the MMU's job. So it tr basically translates a virtual address into a physical address. And it gives you also memory protection. So. Um, for instance, uh, it can allow you to say, 
okay, the stack is not executable, and uh, okay, this is data, so you can write to it, or maybe this is read-only data, so I don't want to allow you to write to it, and it gives you this kind of security. So, um, we'll explain how it was implemented in this case. So, um, this is the same diagram, but even uh, more simplified. So, we've got CPU pipeline, um, giving some virtual address for memory management unit, and it gets translated. Um, but okay, how does the MMU know how to translate this virtual address into the physical address? How does it work? Uh, it's using, okay, it's using the page table, uh, but the page table, as you can see, is located in the DRAM. Uh, so, um, we, we couldn't um, access each time uh, the DRAM to, to do a translation that would be terribly slow. So, um, what was done, oh no, um, okay, uh, first, <laughs> sorry, uh, why are we taking, talking about page? pages, and first, uh, before I was talking about addresses, so why do I switch word? Um, because in reality, uh, you're not just translating addresses, because if you were just doing a translation from one address to another address and like this, so for instance, the address 4 to uh, the address 1 and all 0, 5 to 1 and all 1, you would need to remember all those translations that you would there would be um, a lot of data to remember. Uh, you would need to remember all, uh, all those translation lines and for, to translate four gigabytes, you would need four, four billions of lines. So it can't work like this. So to be more efficient, you use pages and then you take big chunks of memory and you translate those big chunks by what we call pages. So, um, and in this case, it's implemented as four kilobytes. So, by just having one line, you can translate four kilobytes of RAM, and it's more efficient like this. That that's what everyone is doing, basically. So, okay. Um, so, we're accessing this page table in RAM, but we're not doing it all the time because it's really slow. DRAM is really slow. So, we are going through the t what's called TLB, Translation Lucasite Buffer, and it's just a cache, like the instruction of data cache, but it caches a translation of virtual address to physical address. So this way, if a TLB contains information you're looking for, in just one cycle, you get your uh, physical address translation, and you, then you can play with it. So it's pretty handy. And this is a non-chip cache, so it's really fast access. Uh, OK. And then, um, OK, and then in theory, um, the, when, when you are accessing the TLB and it doesn't contain uh, the information you're looking for, because as a cache it's just a subset, it's pretty small, um, you should have a way to then access really the page table in the slow DRAM to get the information and refill the TLB. And usually hardware does this, so the TLB should directly go to main memory and do the refresh. But here, in the design, which uh, was chosen only for, to, be, to be easier to implement and for simplicity, um, we're not doing this. So the TLB won't fetch from page table directly. There is no hardware page tree worker. So we'll need the help of the operating system here. Um, so, in fact, uh, if the information is not in the TLB, it will trigger an exception and it will trap into the operating system and the operating system will have to fix the stuff. So to go read page table, find some way to do it, e even if uh, the MMU is off, etc. And then when the information is, uh, is there, to uh, refill the TLB, to, so to update, to put the mapping inside, and then to resume what's, what, what was going on. So uh, it's a bit like what most MIPSs are doing or even poor PC bookie. Um, it's not the, the, the most efficient way, but it's easier to implement like this. So the TLB is entirely managed by software. Okay. Um, so as I said, uh, the, so the features of this MMU, 
um, only use uh, four kilobyte pages, uh, so it's not configurable. You cannot say, okay, I want one megabyte page size. And so, um, so um, quick question. Uh, I've got a 32-bit physical address. Um, if the page size is four kilobytes, how many bits uh, of the address indicate the offset within a given page? Well, um, uh, um, depends what you mean by this. Can I use addresses on odd address? Sure. Yeah, if you do a byte access, you can. Uh, we are talking about pages. Yeah. What page addresses? Well, so offset within a page. Ah, sorry. Yeah, to to in, to indicate an offset within a page, so it's the the lowest bits. Um, yeah, the alignments when you access um, DRAM? I think that some CPU are just enabled to fetch uh, a byte uh, on uh, an address, and you've got yeah. to fetch uh, more than, than the byte uh, on, an, uh, on a given address. So, in that case, uh, one less byte, uh, one less bit, sorry, to describe the address. But you can do byte addressing. Yeah, is, uh, there is byte addressing inside Micro32. Since it uh, and you, it can be uh, an align, uh, just for the byte addressing can be anywhere. So here's the the usual case. Um, there's no trick in the question. So so yeah, <laughs> it's as as usual. It's uh, it's 12 bits for the for the 4K. So you've got the page number on the left, which is 20 bits, and the offset within the page, which is 12 bits. So there are two TLBs, two, two sort of caches for the translation, one for instruction, one for data. And they are pretty big, but uh, it's to cope with the slowliness of uh, having to do it in software each time information is missing. Uh, so we want uh, a TLB to be really big so that uh, most of the time, if we're lucky, information is not missing and it's in the TLB. So there are 1,024 entries, so 10 bits to index those. It will be useful information for later. So as, a, and as I said, uh, no hardware page tree worker, so it's still TLB assisted. So okay, we have something a bit like this. Uh, so we feed a virtual address, we feed if it's a load or a store, a structure of data, and then the MMU will answer, okay, this is a physical address. And Okay, I grant you the access, for instance, or I deny you it. Um, but here, in this case, since it's TLB assisted, we need a way to say, to say I don't know, because maybe the MMU doesn't know the answer, and then that's where the software operating system part kicks in. So, okay, now let's have a look inside how the TLB works a bit. Uh, so, I'll just walk you through it by um, translating a virtual address. Uh, so let's take, for instance, this virtual address, uh, A000004. I've uh, only showed the three first line of the TLB. Uh, so um, line index is just handy uh, for, the, for, the, for the talk, but it's not actually an information inside the TLB. The TLB only contains a tag, physical page number, a read-only bit, and a valid bit. So, how does it work? So, first we split our virtual address into the page number and offset in the page. The offset is not really useful for now, so we're going to put it apart. Um, okay, so we've got our virtual page number. That's, um, that's the thing we are going to uh, translate. So, we need to translate the A0001. Um, how do we do it? First, we uh, write it in binary. And then, before I said, the TLB is indexed by 10 bits. So, um, we, we take those 10 uh, lower order bits of the virtual page number, and those will index the TLB. So, that will, be, so that will choose the line that is interesting uh, to us. So, here it's 1, so we will choose the line number 1. So, that's where maybe the information is. So then, um, okay, uh, the valid bit is one, so okay, it's at least a valid uh, information. Then we've got also the information that it's a read-only mapping, so 
If the ac access is writing, it will be denied, for instance. Then we've got the physical page number. Uh, okay, that could be our answer. And then we've got this weird information, it's a tag. Okay, um, why am say, am I saying maybe it's information we're looking for? Because um, you saw that I only took the 10 lowest bits part of the uh, virtual page number to address this TLB. So whatever the value of the first bit here, I would have chosen anyway the same line, the line number one. So we have kind of a fight uh, for this line. It could be a translation for a lot of uh, virtual addresses. So we need to check that that's real, really the one we're looking for. And to do this, we're using the tag information here, those 10 bits. So we're taking the value uh, 280, and we're translating it in binary, and when comparing, we're doing the tag check. And, um, okay, we see that it's the same. So that's how we know that it's really the information we were looking for. And then the physical page number column would contain really our result. So uh, the, the physical page number is the B0001. And then to get really the entire physical address, we append the, uh, the uh, page offset. So okay, we've done the translation. That's basically how it works. Uh, at the moment in the Miko 32 CPU plus MMU, um, except that now I needed to add an address space ID to the TLB to, to make it work, so. But that's basically it. So okay, enough for the uh, hardware parts, no. Um, just ex report to you how I um, managed to progress and um, actually running NetBSD kernel. So uh, first, a uh, very cool thing that I enjoyed uh, is that uh, everything is kind of cross-compilation. So I could work, for instance, on my MacBook on macOS, and there was no issue uh, with it. So I could just run uh, this command, uh, and it would just generate for me a cross-compilation toolchain that runs on macOS but targets Lattice Micro 32 architecture, and it was really handy. Uh, build.sh is doing it for me, and it's a pretty awesome tool. I was really surprised. So I had to hack some make files there and there to, to get it to, to work because the architecture was not supported in the tree yet, but it was really, uh, really useful. Um, okay. Uh, an issue I, um, I had was that um, um, the kernel is not linked against uh, libgcc. So I had a lot of missing symbols when I was at the end trying to link my kernel. And I was wondering why. And in fact, OK, I understood later it's li not linked with li li libgcc. So every time there was a multiplication or division of modulus operation, it was ins instead of doing in line the code, it was inserting calls to those utility functions and they were not linked with it. So it, instead the kernel is linked with libkern. And okay, I learned that I had to go to this uh, syslib libkern and add the directory for my architecture and put it, put there the, um, the um, utility functions to do the mathematical operation. Um, okay. Then uh, my first goal was trying to at least uh, get a binary image, to, to get it to link, uh, even if it didn't work, because first uh, <laughs> I've got to, to get some binary to try to run it and then try to debug. So I just tried to, to fill um, the include and configuration and uh, um, directories by copying a bit what's uh, what, what, it, what exists in the other architecture, trying to understand how it works. Uh, Sometimes, at first, I didn't understand exactly uh, what I was uh, supposed to put, so I kind of copied. And, and then, for all the missing symbols, I would just put stubs, because I, I really wanted to be able to, to get this uh, elf image and, okay, try to run it, and then debug one by one all the issue and write the missing pieces. So first stub everything, run this really simple command, and then in the end, when 
I got the, the help, I could try to really implement something. First thing, I, uh, I needed to debug, so I needed to print something on the console. So I did a very basic uh, a console driver only for early prints. And it's really not difficult to do. You just declare a struct where you put your uh, callback function for reading a character or writing a character to the UART. And then it will be used uh, later on. So uh, I needed to implement, of course, uh, the exception handlers. That's the, the first function is the reset handler, which is executed in this case. And then for uh, that's the code executed when you've got a, a IOQ or TLB mess uh, exception or this kind of, uh, of stuff. And then um, at startup, it's called the milk image startup C code. Um, then it, it initializes the console driver by uh, using the previously um, written structure. So if you remember this milk image com comes, uh, and it's pretty easy, it's just you assign to C and tab uh, a pointer to this structure, and then the whole system knows that when you do prints, uh, by dereferencing a whole bunch of pointers, it will end up in your, in your structure and you will call your, uh, your print function. So by just assigning this structure, it's okay, then you can do prints and you can do easy debug. So that was convenient. Uh, then, pretty early in this milk image startup function, you need to initialize the virtual memory subsystem. So you do this by calling the machine-dependent uh, PMAT bootstrap function. Uh, that's uh, basically where you register uh, the physical RAM which is available in the system. You say to UVM, OK, I've got that much pages, and it starts here, and it ends there. And OK, you can deal with it, and you can do allocation uh, on this pool. Um, and then when basically those uh, very simple uh, initialization is done, you can call main function, which is machine independent. And it's uh, basically a very long list of uh, subsystem uh, initialization calls. So then you're in the, <laughs> in the usual NetBSD kernel. So, um, but then uh, you need to implement a few stuff like PMAP. The PMAP subsystem, as I said, is the kind of the, the virtual memory uh, system. Uh, it's not so straightforward to implement, but the really good news and the really good surprise I had is that I didn't have to do it. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> the less you write code, the less bug you have. Um, so uh, since uh, Miko32 is software managed TLB, and there is already code for that, thanks to uh, Matt Thomas, I, ol I only had to use the files in CCUV and PMAP, which I already used in uh, PowerPC Bouquet, and uh, okay, the PMAP system, system was done. I only had to do the, the first function, which is just PMAP bootstrap, but all the rest was working fine so far. So that's a good surprise. Then uh, you've got some stuff like copy in, copy out, which are basically taking data from the user space process copying it to kernel memory and the other way around. Um, then you've got to implement uh, atomic operations. Uh, there is no atomic instruction in MICO32. So and I, by reading basically the kernel code of NetBSD, I learned about this technique, the restartable atomic sequence uh, for implementing the basic compare and swap, which is the core of all the implementation of uh, mutex, spin locks, and all the stuff like this. And so um, it, it works a bit like this. That's the actual code I have implemented uh, for the restartable atomic sequence. So um, um, the interesting thing is that since there is no atomic operation in MICO32, obviously it takes here five uh, assembly instructions. So it's really not atomic at all. So how does it work? Um, if e I'm ever interrupted, for instance, by an exception or most likely an IRQ, for in the middle of uh, this at supposedly atomic operation, then in the return path, when I will return back to what I was doing, so in this case, this atomic operation, I 
check if the PC, the return PC, is in between the CASRAS start symbol or the CASRAS, CASRAS end symbol. And in this case, instead of just returning to the PC, to where I was uh, executing, so for instance, maybe returning to the store world R1 plus 0 R3, then I choose to return to uh, the CASRAS start. So I rewind. I go to the start and restart again. So I found it a pretty cool trick, and I didn't know about that. <laughs> so that's what I use. Uh, then you need to indeed add support for interrupts to, to handle them, but even to let the driver register the interrupt callbacks. So you need to, be, to do a bit of code uh, about this. Um, and then you need the running uh, system clock to let the system be able to, to schedule uh, LWPs, threads, stuff like that. So, uh, so you need basically, uh, on the Milky Way system chip, there are two timers. So I'm using one of the two timers to do the, the system ticks. And, um, and there is a global symbol you need to implement. It's called CPU init clocks. And uh, its main goal is just to set up this. So to, to initialize the timer, to activate it, to register the uh, clock IRQ handler and, and do this kind of stuff. And then another thing is that your clock IRQ handler needs to call uh, a machine uh, independent uh, symbol, which is hard clock. And that's how it plugs it all together to, to go from the machine dependent code to uh, then the, the rest of the system to do uh, the time accounting and the scheduling stuff. So you need to plug to the hard clock system. Then there is a, a whole bunch of other functions that are not detailed because it will be really too long, but you need to implement CPU switch to, uh, uh, which is basically uh, the machine dependent function to switch from one uh, LWP to uh, another. So LWP is lightweight uh, process, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, then uh, KI copy to copy data, uh, set fault to save current context, and, and the fork operation uh, to create process. Um, and a really cool stuff I enjoyed about the NetBSD environment and ecosystem is that the small nine in the parentheses is that for kernel code function, you've got man pages. And you don't have this on all operating systems. So I found it really cool. I wanted to know how to implement CPU switch to what it was supposed to do. I don't have any clue. I could OK read the other architecture, but I, I just had to type man and CPU switch to. And I had my answers and a bit of how it should work. So that, that was pretty uh, cool. And uh, so then uh, other function I had to implement, so SPL is to uh, block interrupts uh, so that in some critical sections you don't want to be bothered by any interrupted, so you can block them and then re-enable them afterward. And uh, OK, CPU start of uh, basically a lot of machine dependent function. Uh, OK. Um, then um, I wanted to try to boot user space uh, when the kernel was fully booting. Um, so uh, to do it, I had to create a dummy RAM disk containing only one binary, which is in it. Um, then I built the kernel with the MFS option, which is memory uh, five system, which allows you to uh, embed inside your kernel image uh, a RAM disk, basically, so a file system, which, is, which will be in RAM. Uh, you insert in the kernel and you, then you try to boot it. That's the approach I had. And uh, that's basically where the, the, pros, the progress of the project is right now. It's the, so the kernel boots and it's booting and it's running the init, which is a really a small handcrafted, statically linked, uh, crappy init just printing hello world. But I find it cool that it it's at least runs. So OK, time for the demo. As I'm saying it runs, let's tr try to see if it's true. Um, OK. Um, so let's just compile it for the fun. Um, just touch one file. Um, and then 
and so I'm, it's pretty easy to, to compile, you just use build.sh and should just compile out of the box. Okay, so then uh, you've got the kernel here. Then you can use QMU, which is really handy to debug, to run this kernel. Um, so you say you want to run the milk image system on chip. Uh, you select the... Uh, oh yeah, it's, maybe it's a bit small. Uh, okay. Um, Is it better like this? Or maybe. Yeah, okay. So, you say milk image system and ship. You say you want to use LM32 uh, with full divider and multiplier and with MMU. You don't need graphic. And you select where the kernel is. So, um, select this kernel. going to happen GDB and uh, okay let's run it with GDB and that's really handy because that's basically how I debug de debugging uh, all the problems I had is that there is a GDB server inside QMU and you can just attach it and look at all memory registers etc so let's attach uh, okay it's small. What? Okay. Okay. Um, I uh, I forgot to do something. I just built the kernel, but I didn't put the RAMFS inside. So if I just uh, hit continue, it should just okay. So you see, uh, at least the kernel boots. So you've got, uh, okay, I've, got, I've put a lot of debugging uh, prints, but basically at the start it does the pmap bootstrap and it registers uh, f using UVM page fizz load, it registers uh, uh, available RAM. Um, so you've got RAM size, you say it registers a bunch of pages in the same system, and then it calls. Okay, then uh, it uh, uh, it initializes a pmap module, etc. And then you call main. I've put a few prints of the main. What's the main doing? So basically, it uh, initializes all the subsystem, and then it's trying to initialize all the drivers. So for now, there are very few drivers, only the timer, uh, then the UART. And the clock, which is uh, the other timer, and it's doing the clock ticks. Then you turn on interrupts, and then it tries to find a root file system, which is <laughs> not, ah, it's not managing to find the root file system, so it's not booting. So now let's try to put a RAM disk. So. So here I'm creating a, a dummy file and I'm putting um, a dev console a character device. I'm creating FFS and I'm copying my init, statically linked init, inside the RAMFS. And then using um, MD set image, I'm embedding the RAMFS inside the kernel. So now it should boot a little bit further. So uh, let's run it again. Um, first, let's see what's inside. Okay. So you've got the main. Oh, yeah, maybe in C. Okay, that's basically what the init is doing. It's really, really uh, almost nothing. It's just 
opening dev console uh, for std and std out, stdr, and it's writing a uh, hello world. So for now, it's really a simple init stuff. And it's statically linked, so all the write and read f and open uh, functions are just inline assembly inside the init. So that's what we are going to try to run. It should print hello, hello world. So um, there is a bug where after init it crashes. So to prevent this, I'm going to put a breakpoint on the last instruction of main. <laughs> Just for the beauty of not having the, the crash printed. So, be so this is a virtual address. And now if I show QMU and I do continue, it should boot. OK. So then you see what's more is that it found uh, a root file system, which is of type FFS, which was in the RAM file system, then a bunch of warning. Uh, and then it's loading in it, and it's running it, and you've got the other world. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you really want to see it crash, you do continue. <laughs> and now uh, you delete the breakpoint and you do continue. And then you get it. Okay. So. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so that's just uh, memory layout, uh, which is, uh, I think it's the pretty usual one. So three gigabytes for user space of virtual memory and one gigabyte for kernel space. Um, so on the Milky Mist board, there is only 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, and the interesting thing here is the RAM window. I will explain a bit what it is. So basically, um, all the physical RAM has been mapped uh, in this RAM window, which is in the kernel uh, address space. So, OK, physical RAM starts as physical address 0x4 and all 0. Um, and basically, all the beginning of uh, the, the kernel virtual memory, so starting as 0xc, all these beginnings, so from c C0 to C8, it's, in fact, a direct mapping to the physical RAM. So by using these virtual addresses, you can basically access all the physical RAM. And that's really <coughs> handy for some stuff. So for instance, here is uh, how I'm managing the page table. It's the pretty, again, the standard usual way. So you've got a, a page directory um, and a page table. So if you want to, tr to again, see where this virtual address is, you decompose it and got, you split it into the 10 bits, 10 bits, and 12 bits. You take the top 10 bits, which are three. So you index and you use the third um, row in the page directory. It gives you the address of the page table. You see C4, it's the same over there. And then you take the following 10 bits and uh, OK, 1, 0, it's, uh, it's 2. So you take the second line. And this will give you, will give you the, the physical uh, address. And again, you append the, the offset. OK, this is, a, this is a data structure in the kernel to really manage and remember all the mappings, all the virtual to physical mappings. But the kernel is running with mem the MMU on. So it cannot. Uh, access to, to uh, physical addresses. It, could, it can't work. Um, so, okay, you, you, you think, okay, I will put only virtual addresses in this structure. This structure, okay, I, I've put uh, C4 uh, to point to my page table, and it's, I'm okay. But I need also to be able to access this data structure from the TLB mishandler. And in MICO32, it's running with MMU off, so I cannot dereference de this kind of pointer. And that's where the, uh, wind the RAM window kicks in, because uh, since it's a direct mapping, it's really easy to translate from one to the other by just doing subtraction and addition. So uh, 
So I choose to put uh, virtual addresses inside the page table and everything. So for, for the kernel, it's OK. But when in exception handler, I just do this computation. So I can work this page table from the exception handler with no, no issue, because I, I know how to translate. So that's, that was the interesting part about this. OK, uh, it's pretty much done. So if you want to follow progress about this port, it's really just the beginning, since it's just loading small in it, and there is no libc port yet, and it doesn't run a bunch of user space stuff. So this is a static web page uh, giving the, the progress. But I try to update also uh, the wiki page on HBSD website, which uh, shows you all what's working, what's not working. and how you can bootstrap the stuff, so get the, uh, the correct uh, Git repository, uh, compile the, tool, the cross tool chain, compile the GDB, compile the Q special QMU port, etc. So everything is explained to uh, directly start developing on it. Then I'm using, I'm, I'm using Git, basically. So I'm, all my code is on GitHub. Uh, but I imported all the um, NetBSD source without history, so it's not an awesome way of working. So a better thing is the HBSD uh, Git repository, which has all the history, which is based on a uh, 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 mirror. And uh, that's, there is a, a short URL about this. So OK, thank you for listening. And also, thanks to all those people, and more that I forgot, who really helped me a lot in this not so easy task, but uh, really cool uh, and full of learning stuff. <laughs> so, thank you. Any questions? I think your TLB is, is very large. Yes. Compared to others, is this, is. do you notice, did you experiment with smaller one and see how the performance is affected? Uh, no, I didn't try, actually. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it's pretty large, but what's cool with the FPGA is, is that I get it mostly for free, because when you're implementing this kind of caches, you're implementing basically SRAM inside the FPGA, and you have special hardware blocks, usually, uh, to implement those SRAM, and anyway, uh, you're usually not using them. So when you do logic, uh, usually you do logic, multiplexers, etc., and you don't use the SRAM block. So they sit there unused. So anywhere you can use them, and uh, you can, can get bigger caches, and, and you, yeah, it's, it's cool. Other questions? Could you explain the process of uh, synthesizing the, the CPU core and uh, world building process from the uh, scratch, a very log source or VHDL source to, to building the kernel and uh, bitstream. Is it possible to build a world soft CPU with your MMU extensions using only uh, free tools, for example, without Xilinx ISA or other proprietary uh, very log synthesizers? Okay. Um. Well, indeed, uh, FPGA world is a bit sad because there is no uh, full uh, A to Z uh, tool chain uh, which are open source. So if you want to do real FPGA development, you are forced to use a uh, closed source vendor dependent uh, tool chain like uh, the Xilinx uh, ISE or uh, the Altera one, etc. So no, if you, you cannot synthesize the whole system on chip, uh, well, Okay, you cannot get to the bitstream to the bitstream file with only uh, open source uh, toolchain. But there is a bit of work in towards this direction, and actually uh, you can synthesize. So only the first uh, part of the of the work because you need to synthesize and you need to uh, map to uh, the block technology, and then you need you do the place and route, etc. So only the first uh, step. Uh, of the pipeline, uh, ca it can be done in open source. You can synthesize Lattice Micro 32 or even all the Mickey Mist uh, system on chip using uh, Yosis, which is an open source synthesizer. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and another question 
uh, is it possible to run that CPU in simulation in, for example, Icarus Valley Log? Uh, yes, it does work and it helped me a lot to debug the MMU when I implemented it. I used uh, several uh, simulators, but uh, I very log also. And uh, okay, it's simulated also by QMU, as you could see, but it's not at the gate level. Yeah. But uh, yeah, y uh, you can run it with your curious. Okay, thank you. So, so how much work was it doing the MMU implementation? Well, um, in fact, uh, it's. In theory, it's pretty straightforward to design an MMU since it's just well a, a, a cache with a bunch of logic around. But in practice, since I was really a beginner, it's kind of my first FPGA project, so it took a year to implement uh, and to test and debug, etc. But in, in theory, it's not that complex. But I, w I was doing this project to learn, so I had my own learning curve about this. Other questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and how much time did it take you to do the um, NetBSD port? Well, <laughs> done the, I mean, how much work? Well, I, as I said, I'm only doing this as a hobby project, so in my spare time, and it took really a hell of a long time. <laughs> 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 Maybe I'm not uh, really good, but uh, yeah, yeah, I started beginning of uh, 2013, I, I think, so it's one year and a half. It's, yeah, it took a long time. It's just one hour there, one hour there uh, in, in the night or in the subway. And uh, yeah, it's really long to work like this. It's not an eight hours straight hours a day. It's easier to, wor to work when you've got like two or three hours straight because then you, you've got to remember what you did before, etc. So yeah, it t took a long time. More questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks.